In this segment, uh, we're discussing other aromatic compounds. Uh, let's just review again what it meant to have a molecule be aromatic, and it's summarized here. Um, we have the following definitions for when a molecule is aromatic. We need to have two criteria, although one could also break it down into more, but basically we need to have a fully conjugated ring with overlapping p orbitals. This requires the ring to be planar, so conjugation and planar. It also needs to be cyclic, and that's what's uh, said here with ring, right? So those are important descriptors as to when we are dealing with an aromatic molecule. And um, we also have learned about the Huckel's rule, in which an odd number of electron pairs will be present in the structure. We also refer to this as the 4 plus 2 rule, where uh, 4n plus 2, where n is a placeholder for either 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, which means we can have a total of 2, 6, 10, 14, 18 electrons, always increments of 4, that's what 4n means, that will then give us the possibility of having an aromatic compound. If we have the same definition as in part 1 copied down here, so conjugation, cyclic, a ring, overlapping p orbitals means that the ring has to be planar, but now the number is a 4n number where n can be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Again, um, differences, steps of 4, uh, which means we can have 4, 8, 12, 16, and so on. We then actually have an anti-aromatic compound. And then it's the last but not least uh, important definition here when a compound is non-aromatic no aromaticity. When the first criteria is failed, which means it is not planar, the compound is non-aromatic. In fact, molecules that could be anti-aromatic will uh, often go out of alignment so that the p orbitals don't overlap to then become non-aromatic, which is a more stable situation for a molecule than being anti-aromatic. We also have other aromatic compounds uh, in which we have full conjugation. Uh, these are referred to as anulenes. And uh, please note that anulenes have a number in square brackets before the word anuline. Six refers to the six electrons. We have two, four, six. 10 anuline means we have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. 14, we have 14. It also means in 6 we have a 6-membered ring, in 10 we have a 10-membered ring, in 14 we have a 14-membered ring. Okay, so we see the parallels here. Anulines can be aromatic, anti-aromatic, and non-aromatic. And I encourage you to practice this with checkpoint 17, 10. Remember that in order for something to be aromatic, it has to be planar. Are all of these structures planar? You may even want to build a model to see firsthand what is going on in the structure. There are also ions that can be aromatic. Aromatic rings can contain a carb anion or a carbocation. So something that's negatively charged or something that has a positive charge and still adheres to what is the Hückel rule. 4n plus 2 electrons, cyclic component, the ring needs to be planar for the p orbitals to overlap. We can have odd numbered rings as well. And this can be aromatic as long as there are six electrons in this case. So a 5 membered ring can contain 6 electrons. If I then was to fill in the electrons, I fill the lowest um, molecular orbital first, then the next one, oops, um, and then the next one, 
and then we're going to pair them up. And so here are my six electrons. We also learn in the frost circle that we need to have an odd number of bonding molecular orbitals that in this case can accommodate six electrons. In this slide, there is a description about a very unusual phenomenon, and that is a hydrocarbon, a molecule made up of carbon and hydrogens only. This is cyclopentadiene. We have double, single, double, single, single. This is a conjugated structure. We had seen dienes before. We know that this can undergo various uh, reactions as described in chapter 16. And the co conjugation, uh, remember that in order for um, having the right hybridization, uh, remember that we have an S and a P and a P and then another P orbital. When we look at uh, just the atomic orbital for carbon, right? We've learned about hybridization, which means that if we are mixing the properties of two different types of orbitals, we get a hybrid orbital. And we learned that in order for something to be aromatic, we need to have sp2 hybridization. So we're getting three times an sp2, and then a p orbital is left over that will then basically um, be the location where electrons can circulate, especially when we have p orbitals aligned all around the circle, right? We had seen that this is a requirement. Now we need to make the cycle for a five member ring. So let's look at the phenomenon for a hydrocarbon, which is fairly stable, but look at the pKa value. It is 16. This is a carbon hydrogen bond that is breaking in the presence of a base. OH minus is a Lewis base, is, is a Lewis base, it's an electron pair donor. It can pick up that hydrogen in the form of a proton to then form a water molecule. And look at the pKa here, it is 15.7. So these are very similar. Here we have a highly polarized bond between oxygen and hydrogen, as we had learned about acid-base chemistry in Orgo 1. But this is a carbon hydrogen bond, and yet this will readily give up a proton to form this anion. And we now see that this anion on this odd numbered ring can be delocalized. And remember that the definition of acidity is, is joined to the stability of the conjugate base. So this is what we're seeing described here. So the acidity of cyclopentadiene is attributed to the aromatic stability of its conjugated base. This is aromatic, this is not aromatic. So it has a lone pair that can be delocalized over each of the five carbons, and it's an aromatic anion. So we're drawing curved arrows, moving two electrons. If I increase the bond order here, and remember there's still a hydrogen that we may or may not want to show. For clarity, we often omit that, but you have to remember there's a hydrogen here, there's a hydrogen here, 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 and here as well. And we're using curved arrows. Once we increase the bond order between this and this carbon, we would have too many bonds on this carbon. So we have to move this out to now form the anion in this position. And you can go all around the ring. Remember to use resonance arrows. These are all resonance forms. Resonance forms means that only the location of electron changes. No atom moves, only electrons move. Let's move on to another uh, iron. Uh, if we're looking at another odd membered ring, seven membered ring, here we have it. One, we can start down here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Frost circle, we inscribe a, a, a circle with the shape of the molecule. We have three molecular orbitals that are in the bonding region. We had set an odd number of molecular orbitals here. We can now fill this up with six electrons. Now the six electrons, um, one of the carbon atoms has an empty p orbital, and therefore it's a cation. Okay, so if we were to draw this, we want to draw a seven-membered ring. I'd like to start out with 
drawing sort of the, the roof on a house first. Then a little bit slanted, but I still want to have bends. Make it a little bit wider. And then I kind of tuck in a boat. And here I am with my seven-membered ring. Okay. Um, now, if I have six electrons in here, I can make this a double bond, and this is a double bond, and this is a double bond, uh, and that then leaves this carbon here. It's the seventh carbon, but we only have six electrons. That will have an empty p orbital. So you have to remember that uh, when we have uh, no electron present, that this is responsible for a formal charge. And here we see the many different forms of the tropillion cation. It has a special name, tropillium cation. It is aromatic because we can use the p orbital all around the ring to now move the electrons and they will average out. Uh, we use curved arrows moving two electrons that then establishes a double bond here, takes away electrons from this position, so that's why the positive charge is here and then you can work your way through. You may want to pause the video and practice this so you can reproduce it, but also your emphasis should be on learning why things are the way they are described here and what the broader implications for this are. Here is an emphasis on heterocyclic compounds, which means that we not only have molecules like benzene, but each carbon could be replaced with a heteroatom an atom other than carbon. In this case, we have two nitrogen compounds. So, and here it says atoms other than carbon or hydrogen. Um, if the heteroatom's lone pair is necessary for aromaticity, it will be included in the Huckel number of pi electrons. That's a very important statement. You may want to make a note of this as you are working through this chapter. When we look at this, also a reminder again to draw all electrons. And we know that there is an electron pair on nitrogen which likes to be trivalent in its neutral form, double bond and a single bond that's shown here. Um, and then we also have an electron pair here. And I also want to stress that when we are looking at, so this is pyridine, this is pyrrole, and we'll redraw pyrrole again. Uh, there's a nitrogen-hydrogen bond. And then I have another double bond here. Pardon me, it's a bit crooked. Okay, now I can draw the electron pair here or here on the inner side. Either way, the structure is correct. You need to understand, though, whether an electron pair is part of the Huckel number of pi electrons, 4n plus 2, or is not part, as it influences its reactivity and overall properties. In pyridine, we have six electrons, 2, 4, 6, that are already in a cyclic array with overlapping p orbitals. Here you have them nicely aligned. And this electron pair here is not necessary to participate. And it's actually tucked away in the sp2 hybridized orbital. Remember that when we hybridize an s plus 3p, when, when we look at the available atomic orbitals, 1s and 3p, we can mix them in different ratios. 1 to 1 would be sp, 1 to 2 would be sp2, and then all of them would be sp3. And there's a certain geometry associated with that. If we mix 1s with 2p, we get 3sp2 orbitals, and there is um, a leftover p orbital which is shown here. So we see one sp2, another sp2 bond, and here's your sp2 hybridized orbital, which now will house the free electron pair. When we look at this structure here, parole, um, we only have four electrons in the ring. We will need these electrons. And it doesn't matter whether you write it like this or like this, or whether the electrons are shown at all. You need to understand that this is an aromatic compound. We see the five-membered ring. Nitrogen is part of the ring. Nitrogen, carbon, 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 carbon. 
we see the aligned p orbitals and we now also recognize that as we have nitrogen is sp2 hybridized there are one two three sp2 hybridized orbitals and this is the p orbital which now houses the two electrons and note that they're all aligned and communicate and in communication so we need these electrons as part of the aromatic system the consequences for this are described in this slide which now shows us that if the lone pair is necessary for aromaticity then the lone pair will not be as basic which means that we need to understand what where the lone pair is housed in this case we learned that this is not part of the aromatic system we have two four six electrons here it can easily act as Lewis base electron pair donor make a nitrogen hydrogen bond this is still aromatic and the second example so we're going from pyridine to parole these electrons are necessary for aromaticity I need to have two four six if this now acts in a similar fashion as shown up here it would form this structure and we now see that we only have four electrons left in the ring the hybridization has changed as well we're going from an aromatic structure to a non-aromatic structure which means that this really wants to go to the left side in this reaction because being aromatic is associated with unique stability as we are looking at uh, so the more stable the conjugate acid the more acidic I'm sorry the more basic I type this in this is basic the molecule is um, as we are looking at the two uh, I also want to mention that the lower the pKa value the more acidic the molecule you may be given the pKa value and assess this and then it's easy the lower number this is more acidic uh, but you can also derive just from looking at the structural properties whether something is more or less likely to happen and where equilibrium lies which was also something you practiced in orgo one in the acid base chapter we see that this molecule is far more acidic than this here so this can still this can go back acts as uh, an acid give up the proton to reform the pyridine in this case the number is, is very low why because this is not aromatic it's not that stable it's going to be more stable when it's aromatic we also see this expressed in um, a electrostatic potential map which means it shows you the electron density electron density is associated with a yellowish reddish color we see that in pyridine the lone pair is localized on the nitrogen and in pyrrole we don't see that localization because these electrons are necessary for aromaticity and this is also they're both aromatic so here it looks more like uh, a yellowish shade um, which means aromaticity and here we see the reddish shade which means aromaticity but we don't see the localization of electron density as it is due to this extra electron pair that's available in the structure there are also polycyclic aromatic compounds um, many of them are, are aromatic we can measure the stabilization energy by comparing heats of hydrogenation remember that you would uh, add hydrogen until you have no more double bonds and that's expressed here we see the stabilization energy um, that uh, is being given and the stabilization energy also per ring so you can take a closer look at this uh, here are three molecules common molecules and representing all polycyclic aromatic compounds uh, remember that we also can draw these structures by using a ring to express that there's aromaticity here it can be an easy overview so then you draw your circle inside showing that 
The electrons are shared throughout by aromaticity. You can do the same for, so this is naphthalene. You can do it for anthracene, anthracene. You can do it for nanthrene. Fused rings in here, either in a linear fashion or even, even um, uh, sideways as shown here. One thing I added, uh, naphthalene, you see the double, single, double, single, double, single, double, single, double, single, right? You see this looks like benzene, and then you may not see that, well, but where's the double bond here? We are allowed to draw it like this. We can draw it in other ways too, and that's what I did here with my software. I redrew the structures. Um, so basically the electrons are shared throughout, and um, you can draw them like this. You can also draw them like this. And this double bond here is basically shared on both sides. Long story short, electrons are shared throughout as in these aromatic compounds. We'll now segue into another portion, 17.8, which discuss, discusses uh, the reactions at the benzylic position. This is basically a review of what you have learned before. We have often discussed stability of intermediates, cations, anions, radicals. You've learned about primary, methyl primary, secondary, and tertiary carbocation stability, for example. Um, you've also learned about the allylic position, and here now we have the benzylic position in these aromatic compounds. The benzylic position is you're looking at your aromatic ring, and then you move one atom out, and that's your benzylic position here. And then again, aromatic ring moving out one position, and you see it highlighted here as well. So there are two benzylic positions. Um, you want to remember that typically we don't see oxidation reactions with alkyl groups and even aromatic rings. It takes different reagents to do anything about this, but here's a review. Aromatic ring is not oxidized under one oxidation uh, condition, um, which is using chromium reagents that can be highly aggressive. No reaction here, no reaction here. However, when we are looking at the benzylic position, we find that this has a unique reactivity because of, of that benzylic aspect. Um, benzylic positions are readily oxidized by chromic acid. I like to refer to this, and this could also be, uh, there's another set of condition, which is potassium permanganate, KMnO4, KMnO4, and there's a quench step there too, so I'm not, you can look it up in the book. Um, so here you have it, H2O and heat. Let's first say that using the reagents that you have learned about in Orgo 1. Um, this will actually chop down uh, one carbon after another and then stop at the benzylic position, which is this one here. So that carbon next to the aromatic ring will remain and then be oxidized all the way up to a carboxylic acid. However, if you do not have hydrogens in that position, here we have a carbon with another methyl group, one, two, three. There's no carbon-hydrogen bond here, so we will have no reaction. And the same is true. So oxidizing re uh, reagent, uh, a chromium-based one, if we take KMnO4, we have some water and heat, and then there needs to be a quench step. This will also chop off each carbon and stop right here. But you need to have at least one hydrogen available in that position and there are actually two. And now this compound can be oxidized all the way up, and then it's quenched, and you can practice this with conceptual checkpoint 1717. And we're not yet done with this segment. The benzylic position, as stated before, is similar to the allylic position and can readily undergo free radical bromination. Remember that NBS uh, has unique properties. Uh, it will introduce a bromine in the allylic position. Uh, so that one hydrogen here will be in a radical mechanism replaced with 
a bromine. That's what this B should be reminding you of. And bromosuccin emid. You may want to look up the structure and maybe review some radical chemistry from Orgo 1. These benzylic bromides are helpful synthetic intermediates. It means we can do more synthesis. It means that we can replace the functionality and have now either we can eliminate bromine, we can replace it with other functional groups. And you learned a lot of material that then um, distinguish between SN1, SN2, E2, and E1. So you can get a whole host of derivatives, which means we are doing synthesis. We're modifying the structure to our needs. And on the next slide, we have a couple of sample reactions. Benzylic bromides really undergo SN1 substitution. SN1 meant that the rate determining step is dependent uh, on the formation, on the decomposition basically of the starting material. Um, maybe what I want to point out here is that we are, um, this is a summary in the presence of water, we can replace the bromine with an OH group, make a bromide, turn it into an alcohol. SN1 means that you have loss of a leaving group, which will give you a cation. And in this case, it's favored to give you a tertiary cation, which was one of the indicators for having an SN1 highly likely. So this turns into a tertiary cation. We can, we can spell it out or just use a number. Um, that will then react with water. So there you have your H2O that's coming in. Remember, you have two electron pairs. One of them is being used to now have this act as an electron pair donor. And then in order to get to the final structure, you need to do a proton transfer. So loss of a proton. I'm just going to use a minus sign here. So it's a proton transfer reaction. If you're rusty on this, you may want to go back to chapter 6, where significant mechanistic steps are described and classified. So in this case, this tertiary bromide, benzylic bromide, is too bulky to do a direct attack from here to here and displace the bromine. It's too sterically hindered. If you have an unhindered benzylic bromide, meaning there are two hydrogens that will enable a nucleophile to come in, we can now have an SN2 reaction, which means that the rate determining step is dependent on the concentration of two molecules, the substrate and, in this case, the nucleophile. It will come in, curved arrow, backside attack. Um, as this bond forms, this bond breaks, and you get your alcohol. Here we have a couple more examples. Benzylic bromides can be converted into alkenes by using an elimination reaction. You learn about E2 and E1. E2 happens uh, when we have a non-bulky base that will uh, some it, it the it will attack um, uh, pick up a proton on the carbon over. This is the carbon bearing the bromide. We move one over, these two are equivalent. I chose to draw this because I have space here. Uh, ETO minus, remember that this is Na plus. And then we have O, and I'm going to do ET as an abbreviation for the ethyl group. Very important to recognize that you have three free electron pairs here negative charge, and how this can now, um, at the same time this is uh, picking up the proton, we will form a double bond and now actually eliminate the halide. And there's certain geometries as well that need to be adhered to 
And now we see here's the remaining methyl group that you see here. And now we have a double bond. So you have formed an alkene via an E2 process. This step is dependent on the concentration of the substrate as well as the base. And the next example here, we see that under acidic conditions, we can have an E1 reaction. This is a source of H+. So a proton. Remember that alcohols are not good leaving groups, but that's why it's so important to, you know, when you want to draw a mechanism, a mechanism makes you have sense of the transformations. Show all non-bonding electrons. This can now... OH is a bad leaving group, but H2O is a good leaving group. It's going to form an oxonium ion, oxygen with three bonds. And then in the next step, you will have loss of H2O. I won't draw it here, but you may want to work this out on a sheet of paper for yourself. And the next and last slide uh, in the segment 17.6 uh, uh, now shows us a summary of some of the reactions that happen at the benzylic position. And you also see references here. I encourage you to look at chapter 12 and 8 to review all the possible transformations and conversion of functional groups. You may want to pause here, maybe jot down some questions and keywords. I also want to highlight that each chapter has very helpful end of chapter summaries. So you may want to go back to 8 and 12 and look at some of the key aspects. And you can practice this with the skill builder module here. Uh, you may also want to review different types of reductions that are out there, whether that's just hydrogen. Uh, you can have metal reduction, sodium and NH3, um, uh, pressure and heat. There, there's, there's, um, there are all sorts of different um, ways of making this reaction go. So hydrogen gas of, will require a catalyst, sometimes pressure and heat in addition. Birch reduction is dissolving metal. Um, remember that sodium can offer one electron, and you may want to look at the reduction mechanisms there. It's also important to understand the role of electron donating electron withdrawing groups.